Richard Skipper celebrates. Every show is a celebration. Richard Skipper celebrates the best in entertainment. Each show, Richard delivers the artists you love, showcasing what makes them unique. Never gossipy. The antidote to a sometimes hectic world. Now, here's your host, your host Richard, Richard Skipper. Skipper. Happy Friday, everyone, and welcome to the latest edition of Richard Skipper Celebrates. What are you celebrating today? For those of you who are here for the first time, welcome. My show is about celebrating. It's about celebrating life, celebrating art, celebrating artists, celebrating whatever it is that you can find to celebrate. And I believe that if you take the time, there's something to celebrate in every corner of the world, no matter what. I am so excited to welcome to our show today, David Leopold, who is the curator of the Al Hirschfeld Foundation. And I have to tell you, when I was a kid growing up in Conway, South Carolina, I was familiar with Al Hirschfeld. I used to go to the library. Uh, my parents would drop me off every Saturday afternoon. And my first stop would be to go to the New York Times. And I would grab the Times and I would go to the preceding week's New York Times. And I would look for the Hirschfeld. And especially at the beginning of the Broadway season, where he would have a compilation of all of these shows that would be coming in that season. And it was always very exciting for me. And then I learned about the Ninas. So that was an exciting thing to go in and count the Ninas and get there. I knew about this long before I came to New York. And then years later, I got the great pleasure of meeting Hirschfeld. I was introduced to him by my dear friend, Carol Channing, and that was a great honor. And it's a great honor for me today to welcome David Leopold to the show. And before we delve into all the work that you're doing now, I want to say, first of all, besides what we're going to talk about today, what are you celebrating? Uh, well, I am just celebrating that I get to do this work for a living. Um, I'm celebrating all the people who love Hirschfeld's work and we find new ways of uh, sharing it with them, showing them things that they are looking for and then showing them things that they didn't know existed. Now, David, I want to ask you because I talked, I mean, I grew up in a, a small town, very small right. town me in too. South Carolina. Where did you grow up? Uh, don't hold it against me, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. <laughs> and we, I was the same way as you, Sunday my parents subscribed to the Times, and I was one of five children. When the Times hit the doorstep, it was a race to see who was going to be the first one. We we went right for the Hirschfelds, and we were looking for Nina's. And it was a years before I finally said, who are these people he's drawing? Mm -hmm. And that started a whole new chapter in my life. So you're saying that originally you thought they were just drawings. You didn't realize that they were drawings of real, honest-to-God living people. I didn't really put any thought. I was eight or nine years old and they just were fascinating to me. And my parents had, you know, it's like an initiation, right? Uh, when you learn about looking for Nina's, it's sort of like a initiation right into Broadway and show business in general. And we learned, you know, <clears throat> first it was just, I want to find if it's in the hair or the dress or whatnot. And then we were like, who is this Rex Harrison person? And who is this Carol Channing? And who, you know, that was fascinating to me because they usually accompany, you know, by the time I started looking at Hirschfeld drawings, they almost always accompanied articles. So I would read the article more interested than if I'd just seen the headline. Mm -hmm. I want to know what, what, what can this tell me about this drawing? And uh, it was really the beginning of a lifelong ongoing uh, fascination uh, with all things related to performing arts and really the visual arts as well. Now, I learned something new about you today. Uh, I learned that you are a twin. Um, I, I asked for a photograph of you at five years old. 
Right. Uh, you said you could not understand why. I'm going to show, first of all, the photograph. Now, did you figure out, is this you or is this your twin brother? No, that's what you have to understand is nobody knows. <laughs> nobody knows? Uh, I don't. Uh, my brother doesn't. Uh, um, family members will uh, um, give their opinion, but there's really no way to tell. We looked exactly the same. Now, is your brother still with us, I hope? Oh, yes, he is. Yes, he is. He lives in uh, Santa Cruz, California, and we don't look the same now. Okay. Uh, I've become more handsome, and he just, I don't know what happened to him. Yeah, that happens sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> well, the reason I ask that question is because, you know, and, you know, and this may have a unique perspective on it, because I've never asked a twin quest uh, person this question, but normally at five years old, I think of that as the purest self. Because mm -hmm. that's before you start school uh, and peer pressure begins to get added on. And you start to become what the other students want you to be. And especially right. what the teachers want you to be or what they don't want you to be. Sure. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about the five-year-old David Leopold growing up in Pennsylvania? I would love to. I don't have much recollection of it. Um, my whole childhood is a wonderful sort of uh, collage of, of really happy memories. Uh, I remember one time I was with Jules Pfeiffer and we were talking about something and I said, Jules, you know, I'll never become a great artist or writer or anything. He says, what do you mean? You bring these books and you do this curating and it's really wonderful. I said, yeah, but I get along completely with my family. Uh, I love seeing my brothers and sisters. I'm close with my dad. My mom passed away about 15 years ago. Mm. And uh, we're just a tight knit group. And we've always been that way. And it wasn't because we didn't have other friends. It's just that, you know, I was lucky to get the right parents. And we just had a great time all the time. That's yeah. wonderful. I love hearing that. That's that's great. But as you started going through school, did you have any aspirations of what you wanted to do with your life? And when did the art world start to uh, consume you or start to seep into your very being? Well, it, when I was a teenager, I really got, I started thinking a lot about the arts, music, and I, I you know, uh, I don't know about you. There was no theater. Theater was something you heard about. Um, there was some community theater going on in Harrisburg, but we never went to that. Mm -hmm. um, I, my first Broadway show was in 1977, Frank Langella and Dracula. Wow. Uh, I went with a school group and it was fantastic. My second show was dancing, you know, which I had no idea what I was going to. Mm -hmm. And now I only wish I could go back there and watch it again. <laughs> you know, I just would be fascinated. Uh, to see it. Well, you might get a chance. I think they're going to bring it back to Broadway. They were scheduled to bring it back when uh, COVID hit, so sure. let's hope that it still happens. Well, it, I'm, and I'm sure it'll be great. It won't be the same. Of know, course it won't. Uh, of, of that production. And uh, when I first, you know, introduced to New York City, it was like the New York Times for me coming alive. I, I you know, in, I'm sure you were the same way in this regard. I read every ad I read every theater listing, you know, I looked at, I read those pages like they were like pages from the Bible and I had to know them. And it was a wonderful, and it led me to books. It led me to other publications. Oh my God, um, you're describing my life. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. I don't think we're, we're, I think there's many people like us, mm -hmm. you know, who, it, 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 you know, I lived in a fairly gray world. It was, you know, it was wonderful, but nothing ever happened in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. I mean, as a teenager, when we started driving around, we would try to get lost, you know, because it would be an adventure to try to get home. That's the only thing that was going on, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and I wasn't, you know, school theater didn't seem that interesting to me. I've never wanted to be a performer. And, but then I went, uh, 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 you know, my parents, God love them. They, they wanted me to have a normal life. Uh, they, they didn't discourage my interest in the arts but they certainly were not encouraging and like, hey, you should do that. But I ended up going to school and getting a degree in theater history and administration. And I really thought I'd be running a small theater in the Bay Area. So I've, I'm a really abject failure in that regard. Um, but luckily I fell in with, I started curating in college and that led to doing more work. Uh, and before I, I, I thought I was going to be a like a, uh, managing director of a theater. 
And I was doing so many curatorial jobs that I realized, wait a second, I think I may be a curator. And then once I was conscious of it, then I started deciding, well, what do I want to do? Because I was just taking, people would come to me and say, well, could you do this or that? And so that's what I do now is, um, I, that's how I met Hirschfeld. Um, I was working on an exhibition for the New York Public Library on theatrical illustration. Well, it was even earlier. Uh, I was doing some research on the artist Ben Soloway, who did charcoal portraits from life uh, in the 1930s of uh, Broadway film, dance, uh, for the Times and the Herald Tribune. And I noticed that the clippings often had Hirschfeld's on the other side, or if they weren't cut out completely, they had Hirschfeld's right next to it. And, you know, a light bulb went off and I said, boy, I should contact Hirschfeld. He was in the phone book. And I was too scared to call uh, because I thought, you know, I would have 16 functionaries who would tell me that I was not, you know, important enough to speak to the, to the master. Uh, so I wrote him a letter and he invited me next time I was in Fun City to come up and quaff some tea. And uh, he wrote a really one. I, it, I got the nicest note back from Al Hirschfeld that I ever got from anybody who was not a relative, you know, wow. signed fraternally yours. I was 22 years old and it was like the greatest thing that had ever happened to me. So, of course, I figured out some reason to come to New York. Uh, uh, um, I didn't need a reason. I had lots of research to do. I had uh, a woman that I was uh, dating who I eventually married and been married happily for 26 years. Congrats, and, uh, oh, thank you. Uh, so I called him up and said, I'm coming up. And he invited We We had... Uh, Tea and cookies uh, at four o'clock, which was his thing. I met Dolly Haas, his wife, uh, second wife, who he's married to for 51 years. And I left there thinking, boy, I've hit it off with Al Hirschfeld. I'm such a, I must be doing all right. I later discovered that everybody hit it off with Al Hirschfeld. He was just that kind of guy. You met him. Yes. The, the guy you met is the guy he was. I spent 13 years visiting him in his studio regularly we went through a lot of things we uh, the death of dolly lawsuits new books uh, uh lots of openings and and uh he, there was the person that you see in the drawings is the person who he was mm -hmm. you know they're an accurate reflection of who he was as an individual but i want to go back for a moment the love of the theater mm -hmm. what was it that drew you i mean you you had no desire to be an entertainer yourself um and there are people who love going to the theater uh, for a lot of reasons. We know the right reasons to go to the theater, but it was deeper than that for you. What was that pull for you that uh, you had that love of the theater? I love live performance. I just, there's being in the room, you know, to coin a phrase, the room where it happens, where it happens. Uh, yes. uh, has always been, I, I went to, I went back to my first Broadway show uh, back uh, last night, I saw the girl from the North Country. Totally recommend it to everybody. Lights go down. I'm there. I'm so excited. I've never lost that excitement. I I I have a joy. It brings me joy. I don't. I can't. I I, I don't know if I need to explore why it brings me joy. You know, I like chocolate ice cream. Do I need to figure yeah. out why? No, no. I like it. Bring it more. You're absolutely and, right. Absolutely. And so that's what I, I I I decided. I don't know what told me uh, as a young person to follow my joy, but that's what I did. And uh, this far into it, I still can't believe I get to do this. I mean, I am the luckiest person you may ever meet. And you mentioned that you you had this thirteen year relationship with Hirschfeld. Mm -hmm. um, could you have ever imagined that you would find yourself in the position that you have now? And if you can just give us a Reader's Digest version, because you've done so much uh, of the road that led you to where you are right now. Um, I never imagined it. If you had told the kid in Harrisburg that he would uh, be friends with Al Hirschfeld, it just didn't seem possible. Um, and... I, you know, it was a series of happy coincidences. You know, he at that moment was looking for someone to organize the archive of his work. He lived in the present. Mm -hmm. You know, he he didn't go to the revival of Showboat. You know, Harold Prince did a revival of Showboat in what ninety four or something, yeah. and he didn't go to it thinking. You now he had seen every Broadway iteration of Showboat to that point. 
he had drawn all but the very first one. He didn't go to it and think, boy, it's not as good as 27 or 46 or 32. He didn't think in those in those terms. He thought about how does it work today? How is, is, a, is a good theater? You know, mm -hmm. he saw it in context of the now rather than it, it, the past. And he really, he, I remember one time I was up in the studio and an old press agent uh, came up and Al was, Al drew every day. I mean, mm -hmm. that was who he was. He was in the barber chair. He was drawing at the table. Uh, this press agent comes in. I'm in another part of the studio doing what I do. Uh, you know, cataloging things, discovering things. That was like King Tut's tomb for me. It, there was just everything. And everything what I thought Al Hirschfeld was a pack rat because there were tons of old magazines in there. And then I discovered they all had Hirschfeld drawings in them. He had been throwing them on a pile for years. And... You know, sometimes he would write on the front of the magazine the page number that his drawing was in. And it was every publication you can think of. I mean, it, it's a much shorter list of publications he didn't appear in in, in the 20th century. Uh, so when so when I came on the scene, it was uh, when somebody said to him, well, what about you did? A, have you ever drawn this or, you know, when did you do that? He didn't have any interest in that. He would say, oh. Uh, I have an archivist now and he's organized everything and I can't, that means I can't find everything. Uh, so you'll have to ask him. And so it was a way of him just outsourcing uh, that part of his life because he, he would rather be drawing. Mm -hmm. And, and for me, I loved it. And that's what we talked about. We talked about art and the theater. You know, we, we spent a lot of time. I mean, that's when he, when we were working, we, uh, we didn't spend a lot of time talking. But at lunchtime, he had tea and cookies every day at four. And, you know, lunch was like an hour long. And, you know, you talked about what was happening today. And then I would be like, or, you know, or even when he was working, I would bring over something and say, well, what's this? And he would lean back in his chair and I could see the smile come on his face. And he's like, oh, so where did you find this? That was the most often heard expression. And uh, uh, a story would tumble out. And he was not a braggart per se, but he was a great rock hunter. And some of these stories I know that he hadn't told in years, if ever. Uh, and we ended up having this vocabulary of his drawings because I could mention a 1932 drawing and he knew exactly what I was talking about. Or he would mention some obscure piece and I would say, oh, yeah, yeah, well, like it's like this or, you know, we I don't know how to explain that. It was a language that he and I shared. And it wasn't, I mean, I love looking for Nina as, as much as the next person, but it had nothing to do with that. It had everything to do with drawing, with the performance, with, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, the characters. He loved characters. And uh, so uh, that's why he had a great, you know, he, his friendship with Carol Channing was, was legendary. Uh, she claimed that uh, he is the one that made her a star. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, he was in this, she was in this uh, review, Lend an Ear, and right. Al did a drawing, a theme drawing of husbands and wives on Broadway, and he included Carol in it. And then he did supporting players numbers who stopped the show, and there was the performer who sings Bally High in South Pacific, and I forget all the people who are in it, but there's Carol Channing uh, as the Magnolia Girl. A gladiola and, Girl. The Gladiola Girl, I'm sorry. Yes. That, no. And, uh, yeah. she, you know, she said all of a sudden everybody started coming to the show and uh, Julie Stein and, and Anita Luz saw her in that drawing and said, that's our Lorelei. That's right. Yeah. And, uh, but beyond that, they literally became great friends because they, they, Al was not a larger than life character like Carol was, but he was totally at home with those people mm -hmm. and they were with him. They, they recognize, they recognized the kindred spirit. And so they would drive places and be singing at the top of their lungs the whole time. Uh, he told me one time they had to drive to someplace in Ohio and they spent the whole time just singing out loud, you know, uh, and I can't, I mean, I can't imagine it, but I can totally imagine it. You know, I was somebody who would get in the car and, to, and drive to Florida for dinner. You know, he did that once and his host said, well, where are you staying? He says, oh, I'm driving back home tonight. <laughs> 
any day. He drove back. Do you ever have any out, uh, downtime? Because it seems, you know, when I think of him, I think of uh, every night being at the theater. And when he's not at the theater, I think of him sitting in the barber tra- chair, uh, unless he was having coffee and tea, uh, mm-hmm. I mean, tea and cookies, uh, that he would always be drawing. Um, what well, that's what he was time? doing. No, uh, it, it wasn't work to him. The, he loved to draw. It, you know, he had found a way to, to make it pay. And he was surprised at that. Uh, and he he learned not to question it too much. He just, he 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 learned just to commit to working on the best drawing he could. Mm-hmm. Um, but he loved it, so it wasn't work. And going to the theater or music or going to a party at a friend's house. I mean, this is a man who at 99 was still doing all those things. Uh, a friend of, of his told me that the only difference between Al at 29 and 99 is that his hair was white, mm-hmm. uh, where it used to be black. But he was lit- and, and when he wasn't going out someplace, he would uh, have people in. And I, and this it this wasn't like a short term thing. We have all of his uh, uh, appointment books, you know, his calendars. And it's amazing. You know, it's every night. And it, it was a lot of theater. But like I said, he saw a lot of music, saw uh, all kinds of things, dance. You know, he was into it. He 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 really took advantage of the situation that he was in, in a, in a very positive way. You know, he he loved going to shows. And he, I think, also still had that sort of wide eyed, born in St. Louis wonder uh, when going to the theater. You know, he was he was literally always amazed. He people amazed him, you know, and he would declare something insane. But that was a good thing. You know, he he if he said something was insane, you know, that it had met his approval. And and he liked doing the he liked drawing the theater because, as he said, it allowed him to sleep late. Mm -hmm. Uh, And when did the transition happen for you when it went uh, when it transitioned from being a friendship? Uh, to being a career for you with the Hirschfeld Foundation. Oh boy! Um, well, when I when I first started working with Hirschfeld, it was it, the friendship in almost immediately after that first uh, visit for tea. I got invited to be his archivist, and I was twenty four. He was eighty six, and I thought it might last two years. And the deal was that we would do. It was going to be very informal that I would call him up and say, hey, you're free Tuesday or Wednesday. I can come up those days. And of course, he always, almost always was. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would come up, I'd park right in front of his house on 95th Street. He had fairy dust. I'm convinced of it. That is a man who could drive a Cadillac into Times Square and find a parking spot in front of the theater. And it happened for decades. And I, he must have sprinkled it on me because I found parking spots. Whenever I was doing something with him, I always found a parking spot. When he died, it stopped. I was shocked. Even on his own block. Uh, I a friend of mine refers to it as Doris Day parking. <laughs> uh, no, because in all of her movies, if she's driving a car, she would pull up in front of a building, get out of the car. Yes. Uh, never in front of a meet. Uh, there was never a parking meter or uh, a fire hydrant ever. She would pull up in front of a building, get out of the car, walk up, and that's exactly what you're describing right now. <laughs> yeah. No, it was. It was one time his car was in the shop, and he lived on the 95th uh, between Park and Lexington, mm-hmm. 122 East 95th Street, um, and he got his car serviced on. Uh, 12th Avenue, like 57th Street. And one day at the end of the day, he asked if I would drive him over to pick up his car. And uh, I said, yeah, sure. And so we drove over there. And it's what's so what was so amazing about driving around with Al is we'd see something and that would start a story. You know, I would ask him a question. I'm like, oh, what about? And he would tell me some funny stories. So we're laughing the whole way over there. And we get to 57th Street, which is four lanes. Uh, and I'm on the opposite side of the street of the garage. And I said, well, look, let me turn around so I can drop you off right in front. He's like, oh, don't worry. And he opens up the door. It's four lanes of traffic. This was like five o'clock. It's very busy and the traffic's moving. It's not backed up. It's moving. And Al Hirschfeld walked across the, the, the street. I saw this. He walked it like Mr. Magoo. 
cars whizzing by, <laughs> and he just seemed to I walk can through see it. it happening. Yeah. And this, you know, it was like watching Santa Claus cross the street. It was just not to be believed. Um, and that was that was Al. You know, he could go to the corner and come back and have a great story to tell. Uh, just because uh, William Sororium one time said that wherever Al went, somebody was always trying to offer him the key to something. And he was kind of right. I mean, at, he had this kind of charisma that attracted people. And Carol was, well, Carol Channing, of course. Right. I mean, anywhere you of went, course. anywhere with her, it was the same thing. Uh, did you uh, ever go to the theater with him? I was at shows that he was at, but we never went together because, you know, uh, even in the year between Dolly and when he married Louise Kurz, mm -hmm. you know, he was the most eligible bachelor in New York. Uh, mm -hmm. There were all these women who would have loved to be the next Mrs. Al Hirschfeld. And not, I mean, he was 95 at the time. He, he, the idea that he would be looking for somebody, he wasn't really, but then he needed uh, someone. He, he, he was a, he was a very social person and needed a companion. And he had known Louise for years. So I never went to the theater with him, but he, when we were at shows together, when we, we were at shows that we both ended up at, sometimes to our surprise, because we didn't say, oh, I'm going to this tonight or I'm going to that tonight. Mm -hmm. uh, um, we would see each other and it was always like, oh, you know, fancy meeting you here. And uh, so uh, we and then, of course, we'd always talk about the next day. You know, I, you know, I remember like Carol's last time doing Hello, Dolly in New York. I was up having lunch the next day at the house and I said, well, how was she? She said, oh, he said, as soon as she came on stage, you knew you were in safe hands, you know, and I would thought, OK, you know, how many times he had seen Carol do Hello, Dolly? Probably dozens, mm -hmm. you know, in every iteration uh, uh, that she had ever done it. And there he was seeing it again. And it was like the first time he had seen it. And did you ever go out socially beyond uh, going to the theater? I mean, you, you running, running into each other at the theater, but did you ever have social occasions that you were at a party or an event together? Um, you know, I look back on it now and I was pretty young and being pretty young in New York, even with someone like Hirschfeld, he was pretty old mm -hmm. and he was doing things that older people did. And I was doing things that younger people did. And like I said, we would exchange notes when we would see each other. Uh, but it wasn't until much later uh, that, uh, like, if I was in town for a while, I didn't, my, I had sublet my apartment. And he would find out that, you know, I was going to stay over at a friend's place or something. He's like, why don't you stay here? And so I would stay at the house uh, or, or we'd go out to dinner or, but, you know, it was our lunches and, I mean, I have the record for the most free lunches at the home of Al Hirschfeld. I'm very mm. proud of that. Uh, very good food served there. I would recommend it to all my friends. And uh, and then sometimes I would bring people to, if I met somebody interesting that I thought would abuse Al, I would bring them, I would say, you know, can I invite a friend to lunch? And of course he was always game. You, I mean, you know, Al, people excited Al Hirschfeld. He was into it. And uh, uh and then sometimes I would meet somebody well known, and I would think, "Oh, they'd like to meet Al Hirschfeld," and Al would probably like to meet them. I remember bringing Stanley Tucci up to mm. Al's uh, house for lunch when he when Stanley did um, the uh, uh, the Joe Gould movie, um, and this is oh I don't know uh, mid nineties, mm. and Al was I don't I don't know if you know who Joe Gould was. Yes. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, you know, Cla Professor Siegel, mm -hmm. a man who was writing the history of the United States based on overheard conversation. And uh, he supported himself by getting a dollar each week from 50 different people. One of those people was Al Hirschfeld. And, uh, and Al would usually invite him in for dinner because, sure, why not? You know, it's just a character that he would have. And, of course, Gould always had some funny story, you know, some crazy thing that had happened to him. And I, and I said to Stanley, I said, would you like to meet somebody who knew Joe Gould? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I love that. And I said, it's Al Hirschfeld. He's like, you're kidding. And what was so funny when I would bring somebody like uh, Stanley up there, 
they would turn into fanboys. Mm -hmm. You know, they would often have a book or two with them. You know, Mr. Hirschfeld, could you sign this? You know, <laughs> and of course, Al was always completely game for it. You know, and we'd go up to the studio, and because uh, the studio's on the top floor of his house, and uh, he, you know, he would. It was a fun time. And then, you know, inevitably, once the person was there for a while, Al would get back to drawing and we'd still keep talking. And people were amazed that he could keep up his end of the conversation while he was producing, you know, a great work of art. But that's who Al was. Um, I'd started to tell you about this old press agent that had come up to see Al. Uh, he he was up there and he was reminiscing with all these crazy things that the two of them had done and people that they had known. And after about an hour, the guy left. And Al, in all seriousness, turns to me and he says, I don't get these guys who just want to think about the past. Like he was perplexed by it. And he went back to drawing because that wasn't who he was. His, mm -hmm. He was interested in what was happening then. He saw all of his friends, you know, rise, have their moment and decline. And he just kept going. He just kept on having, you know, this is a man who had an audience in the millions when he was 25 and he only got more popular, all while doing it completely on his own terms. You know, uh, he, you know, he said that he didn't really understand why people liked the work because when he first started doing it, you know, he said editors would complain, and then all of a sudden he got accolades, and it was the same drawings that he was doing. Uh, so, you know, he he just learned to trust him his himself. Is really what we well, do. this amazing, you know, and I and I think of it as alchemy. I mean, it couldn't be anything but I mean, his relationship at the time with the New York Times and you talk about it. I talked about it in my introduction mm -hmm. of, you know, all across the country, um, kids growing up at the time that we grew up, grabbing the New York Times on right. a Sunday, seeing those caricatures in the New York Times and. Um, we don't have anything like that now. Um, it's true. I think everybody knew more about Broadway during Al's career than at any other time because everybody looked at the drawings and they were the drawings of a show that was going to open that week. I mean, you have to remember when Al drew Guys and Dolls, he didn't know if it was going to be a big hit or a flop. And that wasn't important to him. That's not what he, he wasn't there to judge. But his drawings appeared the Sunday before it opened. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's great drawings of shows you've never heard of, but they're great drawings. Uh, and so, you know, uh, I've lost my train of thought. I apologize. No, um, that's all right. I mean, we're, we're talking about uh, the impact that he had on theater kids uh, around the country or people who had this love of theater. Uh, and I'm also uh, certain that those drawings uh, impacted ticket sales. Uh, of mm -hmm. people coming to New York because they knew uh, from a Herschel drawing, uh, it didn't matter whether it was a hit or not. Herschel drew it. Right. It looked interesting. I want to go. And I and Broadway doesn't have that. And I love Squigs and Ken Fallon, and they're, they're fantastic. Uh, don't get me wrong. They don't have the platform. You know, Al was lucky to have a career at the time of sort of the golden age of illustration. Um, and we think of his work in the Times, and he was in that paper on average every other week for 75 years. Mm -hmm. That represents less than half the work he did. You know, while we were seeing him in the Times, we were also seeing him on record covers, on TV guides. You'd pick up a magazine, there'd be a Hirschfeld. I mean, we lived in a great age where, you know, you would really have to go out of your way not to see a Hirschfeld. Uh, you know, we talk about all the work that he did for Broadway, but he also was very much a part of the Hollywood golden era. Yeah, you know, probably. the work that he did, at, uh, you know, for MGM. And, uh, you know, uh, if you go back and you look at a lot of the MGM uh, poster art, yes. uh, there's a lot of Herschel's Wizard of Oz. Yeah, uh, all, yes, of exactly. Drawings and everything. Yeah. Um, I want to talk uh, a little bit about two areas before we end up getting to the end of our program. And the first <laughs> thing is really about uh, Hirschfeld's U season. Mm -hmm. uh, if you can go back, uh, starting with 1977, uh, when uh, Hirschfeld started putting together uh, these uh, montages, if you will, or right. collages uh, of what the new Broadway season would look like and how that all came about. And well, it was more than Broadway. 
it was when he did those new season drawings it, starting in 77, it was Broadway, film, television, music, dance, uh, art. Uh, very few places you're going to see Cezanne, uh, Richard Pryor, and Neil Young together. Mm -hmm. But you saw it in a Hirschfeld new season drawing. And where did that come from? I mean, was this an idea that he came up with or was he approached to do this uh, from someone at the Times? Uh, was that his brainchild? Where did this all come from? Or do you know what the uh, genesis was for this? I, I don't know. Well, he, as we show in, the, in our new online exhibition, Hirschfeld's New Season, he had been doing versions of this since 1931. Uh he also did, I, I don't have them because they're not new season drawings, but in 1955, he did this mural for the Fifth Avenue Cinema. This would have been on Fifth Avenue and 12th Street. Mm -hmm. um, it was all the people at the movies. You know, it was, it was like the history of film. And it was, you had the table full of villains and the table of comedians. Oh, very famous. Yeah, I, I know them, yes. Yeah, it's a, it's a great piece. It's, you know, it's iconic in that way. So there were always these composite drawings. He would, um, oftentimes a publication or sometimes a studio like United Artists would commission a drawing of the Oscar nominees. And again, it was this composite. It wasn't done in the same way that those new season drawings were done, but he was bringing together lots of people. And so, of course, when the Times, the Times decided to do those new season sections, I'm, I think primarily because they would be a good place for advertisements, because uh, advertising in the, in the arts and leisure section was the most profitable uh, advertising that the Times had at that time. Uh, and so big ads for the new show opening or the new exhibition, or the new film, that was gold for the New York Times. And so that's, I'm sure, what spurred on that new section. Well, if you're going to talk about the arts and you're the New York Times, who else would you go to? Um, and when they gave him the first assignment, they didn't tell him, you didn't tell Hirschfeld what to do. There was no point in telling her. In, in fact, when I would see uh, our art directors sometimes give, you know, they would tell Al very specific things and he would look at the note and he would say, well, I'm not doing that. And, and he would go ahead and do what he wanted. Or if he did what they wanted, it was never as good as what he would have wanted to do. And if you look at those new season drawings, those are really remarkable portraits that are fully integrated in with everything else. You know, they're, they're like uh, threads in a tapestry. Individually, they're beautiful. Together, they're even more beautiful. And uh, uh, I was talking recently with Connie Rosenblum, who edited the Arts and Leisure section for about 10 years that overlapped some of this period. And she said it was always a huge topic of discussion of what names they would give out. Uh, and they were all ridiculously excited to see what would come out, mm. you know? Um, and that was true of almost all the drawings. Uh, that he did for the Times. The arrival of the Hirschfeld drawing at the New York Times was a time that everyone stopped and went to take a look at it to see, you know, maybe they, a lot of those people counted Nina's from the original drawing, you know, uh, and uh, and so everyone would look at it and then they would take it to be photographed. The Times was so scared that something would happen to the drawing that they would make full-size reproductions of it almost as soon as they got it. And the great thing for us is that when they returned the drawing to Al, they would often give him the reproductions that they had made. So we have these full-size vintage reproductions of oh, thousands of drawings from about 1955 to about 1997. And, and then after that, it was all digital. And of course, he's irreplaceable. Let's just be, let's just, I mean, with all due respect to everyone else who does this, you mentioned uh, Squiggs and Ken Fallon, mm -hmm. um, both I, who I'm huge fans of. Right. Uh, but once uh, Hirschfeld was no longer doing his work uh, and he, you know, passed on, um, there was never a continuation of that tradition no. in the New York Times. Um, or, or anywhere else. You or know, there's no people like Hirschfeld beforehand. He came up during a vogue for caricature, but within a few years, he was caricature. You know, in, in mid-century uh, America, if you wanted something like a caricature, 
you called Hirschfeld. And if he couldn't do it, you called somebody else. But literally, he so dominated the field. And he was a relative latecomer to caricature. You know, uh, caricature, and, and the caricature that he did was not the boardwalk caricature. You know, it wasn't pejorative. It wasn't poking fun at, I mean, humor was involved, but it wasn't at the expense of the subject. It was, if it was a comedy, it was a fun drawing. Mm -hmm. You know, it, if it was a drama, you know, when you look at Long Day's Journey Night, it's not it's not pulling its leg. It, it, it was very sincere in its appreciation of what he was seeing. And he really was a visual journalist. Uh, and when he would go to see shows out of town or in previews, he was so focused on what was going on in stage, he didn't know what was actually going on in the show. He was looking for movement and, and gesture that would make, that would be the identifying moments of the show you know, because he would do these cast drawings that are full of all this activity, never told you the plot, you know, didn't ruin anything. There were no spoiler alerts required for Hirschfeld's work, yet you felt like you were seeing the show. Absolutely. Well, I have to ask you, I have a few friends who actually commissioned him mm. uh, to do uh, uh, Hirschfeld's sure. themselves, uh, and they're hanging in their living rooms. Right. You have a Hirschfeld. Do I have? I do not have a Hirschfeld. And that is my my fault, not Al's fault. If I had asked him at any time that I knew him, he would have done it. I felt, you know, and sometimes I remember one time I was up there and a guy writes in he's trying to impress Al. And he's a very important clothing manufacturer somewhere in the Midwest. And he's a big fan of his work. And, I, and it was always funny when say I'm a big fan of your work. I see it in the New Yorker all the time. Well, he had been famously banned from the New Yorker in 1937 up until 1993. Yeah. So when someone said that, I was, I'm sure Al felt the same way, red flag. And they would say, I love your work. I'm your biggest fan. Could you draw me a Liza Minnelli, you know, or something like that? And I would write back, I'm so glad, you know, uh, th this is a variation and I'm paraphrasing. I'm so glad to have met my biggest fan. I'm, you know, you seem like such a wonderful person. I'll be happy to send you a, a Liza Minnelli caricature. I would like a suit in blue and one in brown, you know. And of course, they they would. I know what the reaction was on the other end, just like he knew. They would be like, "Well, you know, that costs money." Of course, <laughs> you know. Uh, uh, so I never wanted to be one of those people. Uh, uh, the only argument I ever got it into with Al Hirschfeld was overdrawing. I had had a good year and I decided, hey, I want a Hirschfeld drawing, not necessarily of myself. I'm, I'm not vain in that regard, but I would see, I mean, I held in my hand incredible drawings all the time. And there was this one from a show you've never heard of called The Show Is On. It's just a, it's a pas de deux. It's a great, great image. And I knew that he liked it. It was in several of his books and I had a good year and I, uh, I brought the drawing over to the drawing table. I said, listen, I'd like to buy this. You tell me what the price is. I think I can afford to buy it. But if I can't, I will pay, uh, I'll pay in installments. You keep the drawing. And, you know, he, he takes a look at it. He's like, oh, this is a nice drawing. And I'm thinking, my, the price just went up. I'm screwed. And he's like, I want you to have it. I said, oh, Al, I can't take it. You know, I do a lot of work with museums. I've done a lot of museum shows of Al's work. You can't profit from it. If you were, it, that would compromise me to a museum person. And I, I explained this to him. He's like, well, I want you to have it. And I I can't take it. No, you must take it. I can't take it. You must. it we were almost raising our voices. Louise came in and said, boys, what's going on here? And uh, he said, David's gone crazy. He won't take my gift. And she says, well, it's decided then. You'll take the gift. <laughs> And I did. I mean, it was it was <laughs> really. Amazing. And where does it hang in your house? Oh, it hangs right where I can see it every day oh, on the great. first floor. I have I have a couple of original Hirschfeld drawings. Some one I that one I got from him, but I bought others over the years. And uh, actually, he that's not true. I have a Hirschfeld watercolor that he gave me. I have a couple of prints that he gave me. Um, you know, he was a very, he was very generous with me and with everybody. And because and he was, a, you can see by his drawings, he's a generous guy. You know, he, he would, he would highlight people like Carol who were supporting players, 
but to him, they were as important as anybody else in the production. That's right. And that's yeah. a very important thing to point out. And I'm glad you did that. Um, again, before we run out, this incredible exhibit is online for anyone to be able to go and watch. Um, and, and all the details are going to be right on YouTube. Uh, watch Excellent. this video. It's right underneath. Um, was this your idea to do this online this season or? Yes. Um, I wanted to do, you know, when we started, uh, we're a pandemic success story. Uh, when the pandemic started, we knew that we would not have the ability to do shows. I, I knew pretty much right away that this was not this was not the uh, end of something. It was the beginning of something, and it was going to go on for a while. And I actually thought we were going to have to close down the foundation. And the board said, no, we want you to keep working. So within three weeks of the Broadway shutdown, we had uh, created this digital platform to present exhibitions. And uh, our first show was uh, one on solo shows called Socially Distant Theater. Mm -hmm. uh, and I wanted to make it, you know, when you're dealing with artwork that is now getting older every day, you know, uh, you want to make it relevant for audiences today. And so I was really thinking about, you know, all the shows opening up again for the, you know, a new season is turns out to be an incredible thing. I mean, when any, any year it's great, but when you haven't had one for two years, is really great. And so I thought that's what we should do. We should do something on that. Uh, so I had the idea and then I had to say, well, look, I can think of that 1970, those new season drawings that I did for the Times in the 70s and 80s were the first thing that I thought of, but 10 of those would be pretty boring. I mean, they're not gonna be boring, but what am I gonna say? Uh, uh, about them. So I started looking through our database, which anybody can do by going online. You can look for uh, drawings by performer, by production, by publication, by date, by theater season, by year. I mean, we try to make it as easy as possible. And I started going through it and I started looking for drawings that told these stories, not just of the new, those new season ones were of all the arts. Uh, he did ones of just theater, his last quote, new season drawing, was of six leading ladies who would be on Broadway uh, mm -hmm. that season, which included Carol and Julie Andrews and Carol Burnett. Uh, that 95 season was pretty amazing. Zoe Caldwell. I think I may have that uh, queued up here. I may be able to show that. Uh, oh, that would be terrific. Uh, let's see if I have that one here. Uh, Uda Hagen, Elizabeth Uta Ashley Hagen. are all in that drawing. Uh, and it's just, I don't know, those names still I'm in awe of. I'll share a funny story with you. Do you know the story of, uh, you know, Marge Champion dis uh, discovered Carol Channing? Uh, do oh, you know no. the story? Uh, when they were casting Linda Neer, uh, and uh, she went to pick up Carol, and she was driving Carol uh, to the theater, and she says, well, what exactly do you do? And Carol says, well, I do impressions. And uh, Marge says, well, uh, like who? And she said, Uta Hagen. <laughs> And Marge said, Uta Hagen? Who does Uta Hagen? <laughs> <laughs> I want to ask you, before we begin to wrap up, uh, what uh, life lesson did you learn from Hirschfeld uh, that impacted you as a human being and a life lesson that impacted the work that you do? whether it be work that you do for the foundation or work that you do in all endeavors of the work that you do? Um, well, it's hard to pinpoint one thing. Uh, I've been very fortunate to know a lot of extraordinary people, some well-known, some not. And Al was, uh, you know, he was a life lover. You know, uh, I saw him go through the toughest times, some of the toughest times of his life. And, you know, when, when Dolly died, I was, really concerned for him. Mm -hmm. And at first I thought he was heartless. He was just back drawing right away. But I realized that was who he was and he was living in the present and that's the way she was. Like I said, that idea of living in the present is really hard for people. And especially as we age, there's this tendency, you know, you get together with old friends and a lot of them do want to talk about the past and you might've had some wonderful times in the past. But if you're not having wonderful times now, it's really, you know, 
uh, I'm not planning to uh, uh, shuffle off this motor coil anytime uh, soon. And so you've got to keep creating new, wonderful experiences. And so that was very much something that I saw in Al. The, in, I mean, I, this is going to sound presumptuous, but it's kind of what we saw in each other. You know, uh, he was very committed to what he did and he was a genius. You know, that was, the, uh, you know, he had that special something that uh, he was a genius. But uh, there's a lot of people who do are, you know, you're doing what you love to do. Absolutely. Uh, and and I'm doing what I love to do. And but I'm surprised I have a, a son. He's now 19 years old. I was surprised when he was younger and you're really spending a lot of time with other parents. Uh, almost all the parents, certainly almost all the fathers were doing jobs that they hated and they did it all every day and they were going to be doing it for another 25 years. Looking for and, retirement. Waiting right. For and retirement. that's Waiting all their, they, they live their life for retirement and then they fall over dead when they retire. And I just, I never understood that. I mean, look, if a car hits me today, I will be disappointed not for the things that I should have done, but the things that I'm not, I haven't gotten around to doing just because I, you know, it's another day, you know, I, you know, uh, do what, do what you love. Uh, as I've got a, a son now who's at that stage in his life deciding what he wants to do, you know, everyone tells him schools should be about getting a job. And I'm like, it's about getting, learning as much as you possibly can. You know, this is the time and you will figure out your job later. You know, just learn and live, learn, love, and then everything else will come into into being. Absolutely. I'm glad you said that. Before we uh, sign off, I one of my favorite shows uh, was Inside the Actor's Studio with uh, oh, yeah. uh, with James Lipton. And he oh, always did his show with his questions. Uh, so I've got some random questions. Okay, oh, good, good, good. Uh, to uh, wind up. Um, and the first question is, who in life have you felt uh, the strongest need to protect? And you probably have already told us about him. What? Who do I feel the need to for the strongest need to protect? Protect in life. Well, probably you know, obviously my family, my son is. That's a very big part. But you know, I'm not so worried about protecting him. He's taller than me. He's smarter <laughs> than me, and he's more handsome than me uh, at any age. So I'm not so worried about him. I do worry about people I don't know that are uh, suffer everyday indignities because we live in a world that somehow feels like uh, uh, we shouldn't look after our fellow person. You mm. know, uh, I, I've never understood that. And so I do spend a lot of time. Look, we have a whole arts education program uh, uh, from the foundation that we created with the New York City Board of Education to bring arts education to kids who do not get it. You know, uh, um, and because schools think arts, what you know, we can't pay money for an arts teacher. Mm -hmm. so we've created a full curriculum uh, that's for theater, uh, uh, music, uh, uh, visual arts, uh, dance, where and, and from K to 12. Um, and we're getting it into schools. We did this whole pilot program right before the pandemic with six really under serves uh, schools in the Syracuse, in, in the Syracuse area. And the response was so incredible. That's Just great. So, so incredible. Um, and so I feel like those are the people we need to protect and encourage and support. You know, uh, I protect and support maybe uh, are interchangeable for me. That's wonderful. Um, what would you be best at were you to change careers? Um. I think I would be a very good ticket taker. I think I would be an excellent usher. Okay. I'm, I'm very well, I'm very familiar with theaters. I know what the audience experience should be like. I would be a very good usher. Okay. Um, whose brain power have you found most intimidating in this business that you're in? Just about everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> good answer. Uh, what is the hardest thing to forgive in your profession? Hardest thing to forgive. Don't really think in those terms. Uh, it upsets me when um, 
I can't take uh, rudeness. Uh, I just, that bothers me to no end. Uh, when people are rude to each other for whatever reason, you know, they think they know more than you or whatever. I, I that bothers me. Mm -hmm. I don't mm -hmm. know why it does. It just does. No, I, I'm, I'm with you. Mm -hmm. uh, what is the job that you've had in your career that you've enjoyed the least? <laughs> I don't take those jobs. <laughs> oh, I love you. That's great. Uh, <laughs> what issues are you most hypocritical about in your profession? Um, that I'm hypocritical about. Um, well, so I go to a, a number of museum exhibitions and uh, that's a busman's holiday for me. And I always feel that I could do better. Okay, good for you. <laughs> and, and, but when I see them, of course, I tell them how great they are. But I often wonder like, why did you do that? And I would have put it oh. over here and you know, that type of thing. What is the one thing about your profession that you love the most? Well, uh, it, uh, uh, creating something that people that people love, you know, when I uh, whether it's an online exhibition or an in person exhibition, when you can gather together art that uh, will inspire uh, or um, validate somebody, that is a great great feeling. Um, I, I you know I'm behind the artist because the artist really is done done that but when i put it all together and sometimes i've got a show on right now of a regional painter uh in a museum in pennsylvania and it's very very satisfying to me that the show is exact he didn't know how the show was going to be and i had this with hirschfeld they didn't know how the show was going to be but when it's all put together they're like oh i wouldn't have done this any other way and you know and that's a great feeling and something i love to do that's wonderful. Uh, what do you think is the best thing about your profession? And perhaps you've just answered that question. I think I just answered it. <laughs> yes. I, and this is the I hope last. I answered the last question. <laughs> yes, and I'm going to. Uh, you have, and I'm, this is the last question I'm going to ask. What is the one thing about your work that uh, makes you the proudest? And perhaps you've answered that as well. Well, yes, all those things that I said. Uh, I, I'm. Uh, and then there's the, also the other group of uh, artists that I work with are the, the historic artists, the ones who are no longer here, where I'll work. Uh, I like to, I, I'm never going to do a Picasso show. Not that I wouldn't want to do it and maybe even have something to say, but Picasso doesn't need me. Uh, but the underappreciated artists that have had a career and passed away and are forgotten to bring them back to life and just as importantly to have their family see the validation of people appreciating their father typically or their grandfather sometimes a mother or grandmother um it is that's a great great uh that some of the happiest times that i've had um because they you know they know it's been great they just didn't have a way to, to share it with others that's great. David, don't go anywhere for a moment. Um, okay. I want to thank everybody that uh, tuned in today. Um, sure. I'm sure I can speak for David when I say this. Uh, those of us who do what we do uh, in the arts, uh, we don't take it lightly when you yeah. decide to spend a little time with us. Uh, so thank you uh, for spending the last hour with us. If you popped in for a few minutes, uh, if you spent the whole hour with us, thank you uh, for stopping you're still by. awake. And you're still awake. Um, no, I truly had a great time. I hope you had as much fun, David, I as did. I did. Um, if this was your first time here, uh, there's a little button on my banner, and it says, join the celebration. I got rid of the word subscribe, because to me, the word subscribe is a faceless uh, right. uh, entity. And I think of this as a celebration. I've celebrated over 300 other artists, and hopefully there'll be 300 more, including David, uh, that will uh, celebrate even more. Um, please hit the join the celebration button. Uh, leave a comment on today's show. Uh, share this with your friends and followers. Please check out Hirschfeld's new season. Uh, it, it's great. It's really a lot of fun. Uh, it will bring back a lot of memories, some of that you are going to be familiar with. Count the Ninas, they're all there. Um, have, you'll have a lot of fun with it and tell your friends about it. Um, I also uh, end every show 
by telling everyone to go out and do something nice for somebody else without expecting anything in return. Uh, go to your Facebook friends list and reach out to the third name on your list and reach out with a phone call. Not an email message, not a text message, right. not a private inbox message, a phone call. And let that person know what they mean to you. Uh, because as my dear friend David Friedman always says, we're all in this together, but we're not in the same boat. And I always say, if you're going to go out in a boat, make sure you bring a skipper along. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, David, I'm actually going to leave the screen and I'm going to give you the final word. Anything that we've talked about today that you want to build upon, anything that we didn't talk about that you wish we had, or just any message that you want to put out to anyone who's watching right now, I thank you for the gifts that you've given to the world and that you're going to continue to give through the work that you're doing. Um, I hope that I've celebrated your body of worth today. I hope that you will continue to stay in touch. Uh, thank you for being here. And uh, don't worry about how to end the show. As soon as you say goodbye, I will end the show. Thank sure. you for being here today. And uh, let's stay in touch, please. You thank got you. it. Thank you, Richard. Well, that's the, one of the first things I want to say is, is thank you, Richard. The, uh, I love that he has put together a celebration of life and, and people because that's really what it's all about. Um, at the Al Hirschfeld Foundation, go to alhirschfeldfoundation.org. If you like Hirschfeld, you will see as much as you want to see and a lot that you didn't even know existed. Um, we put on exhibitions there. If you are fascinated by Nina. We have a whole exhibition last, uh, this time last year was the 75th anniversary of the very first Nina. Um, you can follow us on uh, Twitter at Al Hirschfeld, um, on Facebook at Al Hirschfeld Foundation and on Instagram. And um, we, right now we're uh, actually, we have a whole online store because, you know, it's 2021. And uh, right now this month we're running special uh, offers uh, each week for selected groups of limited edition hand-signed Hirschfeld prints. And you can save hundreds, if not thousands of dollars uh, by visiting our, our website um, and, and learn what the promo codes are on our social media channels. Um, and if I don't know what else to tell you other than uh, Al Hirschfeld would have been having a good time no matter if we were at the tail end of a pandemic or not. And I think you should go out and have a good time. I know I certainly am. Thank you, Richard, for having me. And I'm looking forward to uh, watching you celebrate with the next person. <laughs>